Ah, welcome. Warm yourself by the fire. Have a seat or snuggle up in your favorite spot and let me tell you a story. A Father's Last Thoughts Researched, written, and narrated by me. He could crawl no more. He propped himself up amidst the debris and chaos to catch his breath. His thoughts turned toward home, his wife, and children. He pulled the ambrotype that he held dear and gazed upon the faces of his children, took in each outline of their forms, and a flood of memories for each little life, however brief, filled his mind. Would he go home? Would they know what happened to him, or would he be forgotten like so many others? Oh, to hold his wife and children one last time, to tell them he loved them, and to make sure they would be okay. As the vision blurred and light faded, a lifetime of memories and regrets flashed in an instant. Then, darkness quiet, and peace. Amos Humiston was born April 26, 1830, in the town of Owego, Tioga County, New York, into an average family of the time. Amos's father passed away when he was approximately six to seven years old, and a short time later, he lost his sister Mariah to a drowning accident. Amos did attend school and learned the basics, but at about 15 years old, he began an apprenticeship as a harness maker. By the time he was 20 years old in 1850, Amos wanted more than a harness maker's life of back-breaking work and wanted more adventure and the prospect of making a great fortune. So he set to sea. In 1850, Amos signed his way onto a whaling ship, the Harrison, and soon realized his reality of adventure. After nearly three and a half years of back-breaking and dangerous work, Amos finally came home and found that his final payout was around $200. He did have to pay the ship's store for clothing and other items needed for doing the job for which he was hired. I mean, after all those poor ship owners and their expenses. Amos realized that high sea adventure was not what it was cracked up to be. Amos left for home and went back to working leather. After going to work for his brother in Camden, Amos met and married Felinda Betsy Ensworth Smith, July 4th, 1854, and they set out to start a family of their own. Amos then left his brother and started a harness shop with his childhood friend, George Lilly. Amos seemed to find what he was looking for in life and soon had the stability of family and trade. Franklin, Frank, was born April 10th, 1855. Then Alice, March 30th, 1857, and finally, little Frederick, in February 17th of 1859. Life was good, but all good things must come to an end, and life was never promised to be fair. Like so many others, April of 1861 had a profound effect on Amos. He struggled between the responsibilities to his family into his country. Amos was no coward and would not be seen as one. There was a fight for freedom and a country at stake. He needed to go. Felinda begged and pleaded, but his own convictions to a greater cause and something beyond himself, along with the encouragement of their local pastor and a promise to look after his family, saw Amos off on another adventure to war. Amos enlisted in Company C, 154th New York Volunteer Infantry, 
on July 26, 1862, and was officially mustered in as a corporal on September 24, 1862. By mid-October, Amos found himself with the Hardtack Regiment and was promoted to sergeant in January of 1863. During Major General Burnside's failed mud march, Amos wrote to his wife, saying, We started to attack the Rebs, but the mud was so deep that we got stuck, so we had to give it up and wait until the weather was all better. At Chancellorsville on May 2, 1863, Amos found himself overwhelmed by Stonewall Jackson's Confederate forces and took a bullet that glanced off a rib. Though battered and sore, he was alive, and he made his escape of the onslaught and wrote to his wife, saying, of the failed bullet, If it had not, I should not be writing to you now. After the end of the campaign and return to camp, Amos received his prized possession, the ambrotype of his beloved children. Amos wrote to his wife, I got the likeness of the children, and it pleased me more than anything you could have sent me. How I want to see them and their mother is more than I can tell. I hope that we may all live to see each other again, if this war doesn't last too long. July 1st, 1863, found Amos under Colonel Charles R. Coster's 1st Brigade and facing two Confederate brigades around the area of Coons Brickyard in Gettysburg. The delaying rearguard action kept the Rebs busy while Union forces set to occupy Cemetery Hill, but at an enormous cost. Amos found himself bounding from one area of cover to another and returning fire, but soon realized they could hold out no more. The intense fire, bodies of his dead and wounded comrades piling in the streets of Gettysburg. He turned to make a retreat at a lieutenant's orders to get out. Amos was last seen alive running down Stratton Street and across the railroad tracks. As he ran, with bullets angrily zipping around him, one found its mark. Amos would have been knocked and stumbled forward with his momentum, feeling as though a two-by-four had been smashed across his back and having the wind knocked out of him. Trying to catch his breath, he would stagger to gain his feet, fall, and crawl. The effort would have been overwhelming. Unable to go further, Amos found himself in a lot off of Stratton Street, owned by Judge S. R. Russell and adjacent the railroad tracks, looking at his children for the last time. There is some dispute as to how or by whom Amos was found. However, he was described as unrecognizable, which is not surprising. It was not until July 4th that the Union burial details were sent out to retrieve and bury the dead. The Confederates had already been retrieving and burying their dead, even during the battle, but that was not the Union priority. So, like many others, Amos was left exposed to the heat and humidity of Gettysburg for several days, and the rains of July 4th did not help matters. Major Warner wrote that the bodies were so swollen and disfigured that recognition was impossible. There are several stories or persons that have been credited with finding Amos and the ambrotype of his children, but only one story makes sense to me. Benjamin Shriver, a Grafenberg saloon and innkeeper, and well-known local, was supposed to have traveled the approximately 13 miles to Gettysburg in order to check on his daughters who had been entrapped there during the battle. It is thought that one of his daughters, being curious as most young kids are, began roaming the area sometime on or after July 3rd. Coming across Amos, she would have seen the ambrotype and picked it up. 
It's unknown if she told any military officials where she found him, but certainly not what she found or took. At some point during his visit, she told her father what she found and gave him the ambrotype. Benjamin returned to Grafenberg and placed the ambrotype in the saloon. A Dr. John Francis Bournes from Philadelphia and three companions en route to Gettysburg to help with the wounded had a wagon malfunction in front of or near Benjamin's saloon. Dr. Bournes was soon being shown the ambrotype of the children and hearing the sad fate of their father. Having told Benjamin that he and his companions were going to Gettysburg to help the wounded, Dr. Bournes convinced Benjamin to give him the ambrotype in an effort to identify the soldier and make contact with the family. Having agreed, Benjamin gave the picture to Dr. Bournes, who then went on to Gettysburg. After determining where the unknown soldier was temporarily laid, Dr. Bournes made sure to have the soldier's grave easily found and identifiable for when he found the family. Upon completing his task of more than 21,000 casualties in Gettysburg, Dr. Bournes returned to Philadelphia. He went on to make several copies of the Ambrotype for distribution, and on October 19, 1863, the Philadelphia Inquirer printed a heart-wrenching story under the headline, Whose Father Was He? The story spread like wildfire and touched the heart of a nation ravaged by war and for many who knew all too well the pain of sacrifice and loss. While no picture could be copied in the newspaper, Dr. Bournes had provided contact information and sent a reprinted photo to anyone that inquired. Philinda had heard of the story while in New York, and having had no word or letter from her husband in some time, Dr. Bournes received a letter from her sometime in November requesting a reprint of the photo. Upon receipt of Dr. Bourne's reply, Felinda knew that her long agony and the fate of her husband had come to an end. The unknown soldier and loving father was Amos. The American Presbyterian wrote that Felinda, while grieved by the realization, the severity of the blow was tempered by the dying affection of the father, by the tender romance of mystery which enveloped the facts, and by the widespread interest the case had awakened in patriotic minds. In January 1864, Dr. Bournes traveled to Portville, New York, where he met Felinda and her children. He gave her the ambrotype, her trembling hands reaching out to the blood-stained picture she had sent her husband nine months earlier. The story went on to garner sales, songs, and reprinted stories, with the proceeds going to help the family, and Felinda was able to apply for and receive a pension for herself and her children. Through the help of the Sanitary Commission, Dr. Bournes and others an orphanage for orphans of the war was established in Gettysburg and other places. On October 25, 1866, Felinda was accepted as a housekeeper and then headmistress of the orphanage, and she and the children moved in to great applause. Soon, the orphanage was filled with other orphans of the war. I believe that the fulfillment of her work in being close to the site of Amos's death and marked grave in the National Cemetery gave Felinda her closure and peace. Love blossomed for Felinda once again, and in October 1869, she married Asa Barnes, a Presbyterian preacher who had visited the orphanage, and the new family moved to Massachusetts moving on from Gettysburg, but never forgetting Amos. While this is a well-known story to most Civil War historians or history enthusiasts, some may not be as familiar. Quite often the story ends with an unknown soldier being found and having died alone, gazing at a picture of his children. 
many are often left to wonder how the whole story ends. So here's some of what I found. Franklin Frank Goodwin Humiston grew into a well-known and beloved town doctor, husband, and father. Due to complications from gallbladder surgery, Frank passed away December 30th, 1912, at the age of 57. It is said that due to her age and yet another tragedy, Felinda's health rapidly declined at the unexpected death of Frank. Felinda Humiston passed away November 18th, 1913, less than one year later at the age of 82. Frederick Roy Humiston grew and had a family of his own. I have no listed cause of death for Frank, but some bonds are not long to be left unbroken. Frank passed away March 2nd, 1918, less than six years after his brother Frank, and less than five years after his mother, at the age of 59. Falinda, Frank and his wife, Frederick and his wife, are all buried together in the family plot. Alice Eliza Elizabeth Humiston never married. Trauma affects in different ways. Alice had lived with her mother and worked at different jobs, but since the death of Frank, her mother, and Frederick, she was the only one left with the memories of that terrible war. Alice moved to Glendale, California, to live with her niece, Alice Mildred Humiston, oldest daughter of Frank. Alice Mildred headed the UCLA Library Department until she retired. Like her aunt, she too never married. On December 16, 1933, Alice was cleaning near an uncovered or open-flamed heater when her clothing burst into flames. Alice was rushed to the hospital with full thickness burns over her body. Alice Eliza Elizabeth Humiston passed away two days later on December 18, 1933, at the age of 76. Alice Mildred Humiston, Frank's oldest daughter, passed away January 19, 1968, at the age of 80. Aunt and niece are buried together. On July 3, 1993, a memorial was dedicated to Amos Humiston and his Children of the Battlefield on Stratton Street, at the site of his wounding and near his place of death. This is the only memorial dedicated to an individual enlisted man at Gettysburg Battlefield, and is a fitting tribute to a story that restored hope to a nation during the horrors of war. As I have said before, Amos Humiston is merely one story among tens of thousands whose ripple in the torrents of war washed over every corner in life in a young country. Blue or gray, yank or reb, these were fathers, husbands, sons, and brothers. Their blood ran red. They loved and were loved felt happiness and pain. It is easy to look at black and white photos and forget the world that they saw, its brilliant colors, the feeling of a soft breeze upon their face, and the dreams had and lost. Each story deserves to be told and needs to be remembered. These were Americans, and not as far removed in history as we might think. If you like these stories, please subscribe, like and share, and don't forget to hit that notification bell. And as always, I thank you for taking the time to listen. The End